What's going on, everybody? So we got my best friend, David Hunter, back here again. I say my best friend because every time I talk to you, I learn a ton. So first off, welcome back. I think this is your third time, so it's great to have you again. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I'm glad to be, glad to be back. It's a pleasure. So obviously, the you know the last few times we spoke, we got a ton of general market context from you, just in terms of how you view things, why you view them that way, those sorts of things. And I figured that today it would be really um, engaging to kind of follow along that same thought pattern. That's actually one of my favorite parts that we've kept this fairly regimented, you know, every three or four months, because you get to see how you perceive information as it rolls out. And I think that's actually really informative for people. It's like we were just talking about, just about everybody on the internet wants the magic answer, but unfortunately, you know, circumstances continually change. So what I really value in these conversations is you sharing your experience with us and essentially teaching people how they can think about things and come to their own conclusions, you know, again, leveraging your experience. So I'm really looking forward to, to chat with you. So I figured a great first softball starter question is, how do you think the Fed is handling the current market? <laughs> yeah, that, that's one that might take the rest of the, the interview. You know, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a mixed bag for sure. Um, you know, the, the Fed's got a tough job on their hands. Um, we had inflation break out in the last year uh, to levels we haven't seen in 40 years. Um, they uh kind of slow walked it initially and thought it was transitory so all of a sudden in january when it really started heating up they had to play catch up and they've been playing catch up ever since um you know i have probably a little bit different view than a lot of people and i've been a fed watcher for all of my 49 year career and i've seen all the various um fed makeups you know through that time and fed chairman um, I and I've had a mixed review on Powell over his career, over his time here in, in the chair. Um, you know, back in in 2018, I was really critical of him. He was fairly early on in that role, and he made some blunders, and you know, the market um, sold off because of some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but more than that, he he just it was showing that his inexperience at that time. Um, you know, fast forward to March of 2020, and he stepped right up to the plate and did the job he had to do to, to save the system when we're shutting down the, the entire economy. Um, so I gave him plaudits for acting quickly and decisively. Uh, you know, you're not going to be perfect when you're in that kind of environment, but he did a good job. Um, and then now, uh, certainly these last few months, I, I fear he's He's doing what he has to do in terms of you can't ignore the inflation. You've got to tighten. So I agree with all that. But some of his rhetoric and, and um, you know, their kind of um, long runway for tightening and things, I think is showing that he does not really understand the magnitude of the risk that is out there. Uh, I feel they are over tightening. And frankly, it's funny to say that because they really are. You know, they've only hiked a few times. Uh, they're still way um, under what the market is in terms of market rates. Um, but the market did the tightening for him, and I'm not sure he understands that. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, some concerns there. I do think they should pivot uh, fairly soon. Um, whether a pivot means just a pause in, in the rate hikes uh, after we get through July, or whether he's going to, you know, take longer to recognize the need to pause and the need to pivot, uh, it's hard to say. Um, but frankly, I think the economy is rolling over. There's a lot of things I look at that it's not that you're going to see it immediately in the GDP number or, uh, you know, every every economic uh, data point that comes out is going to be negative. But in general, we're seeing the things that lead to a pretty sharp downturn. And I'm not sure, again, the Fed is doing enough forward looking. I think they're so caught in looking at the present and looking backwards uh, based on looking at data, which is telling you what happened last month, that I think they're going to end up being, as they almost always are, 
uh, late in recognizing the need to shift. And so, you know, on that basis, I'd say he's, um, you know, he's back in my doghouse in terms of uh, still learning on the job. You live up to your continued reputation as a contrarian, because I think you're the first person I truly have heard say that you're postulating that they might be over tightening at this point, especially, you know, there's even more conversation about the next uh, rate hike a while. They were talking about hundred basis points. Then they said, no, nah, that's a little too much, maybe, you know, 75 basis points. And it seems like your perspective is even that might be too much. But I would be really curious to understand, you also mentioned, you know, the, that the market did some of the tightening essentially on the behalf of the Fed. So when we think about July and we think about you, the next quarter, what do you think should happen with rates? And more importantly, why do you think that? Yeah, so first of all, the, the reason I say the bond market has done a lot of the tightening for the Fed and did most of it prior to their first hike um, back in uh, April is because you had a 200 basis point jump in rates in a very short period of time, just a few months time. Uh, so you went from you know, extremely low rates to you know, 200 basis points up on, on that low base was a huge jump, historic jump. Right. Um, that's already showing up in terms of housing is rolling over. Um, it's showing up in terms of retail sales and and the inventory build that we're seeing in retail uh it's showing up in uh consumer confidence or consumer sentiment the michigan consumer sentiment is the lowest that series has ever been i think those are all signs that that even though it's still historically low rates when you have that magnitude of a change in a short time it's that rate of change in the rate that can have a, a dramatic impact impact I mean, simply put, a mortgage rate that was, you know, two and three quarters is all of a sudden 6%. Right. That's a huge change uh, for home buyers. And, and it really shut down activity. And maybe as important or maybe more important, it shut down refi activity. For a long time, with rates so low, uh, there was the ability for uh, homeowners to refi pull money out of their home and have spending power that didn't uh, didn't mean they were building you know, their credit card balances up. And and because their home price were going up, they said, hey, this is, I'm just taking some of the equity out of my house to do things. And now with rates where they are, there's hardly any and probably no refi activity at all. That's a right. huge, uh, huge um, drain of liquidity that had previously help the economy. So those are the things I mean. And, and then the other tightening really isn't the bond market. It's, it's the big run up in gasoline prices and, and home heating oil prices. So that, that was another tax on consumers uh, that really, um, you know, the Fed has to account for because it does take money out of the, out of the consumer's pocket and money that might have otherwise gone to going out to dinner, you know, buying, um, you know, new furniture, what have you. People are saying, I'm, I'm just getting by. I'm doing what I can to get by. And frankly, with the run up in credit card balances of late, I think they're not even getting by. They're, fi they're finding they have to, you know, they've, they've drained their savings. Savings is down at uh, sharply lower levels than it was the last couple of years. And now they're turning to their credit cards because it's costing, you know, the cost of living's gone up so fast. So while I understand the Fed's focus on that cost of living and saying, we gotta get inflation down, it's hitting the consumer. They also have to realize the other aspects of, of what that cost of living has done. It's, we're gonna see, you know, their whole goal is to, um, basically have demand destruction and bring inflation down. That's the way the Fed can control inflation or have any impact on inflation. But they have to understand that you're going to see maybe a lot more demand destruction than you're counting on. And by the time you see it, if you wait for that, you've gone way past the time when you can turn this thing back up 
and have a soft landing. So that's that's the crux of the problem is I think the Fed is at risk of creating a hard landing here because, as I say, they don't really understand the leads and lags to their policy. Right. When you see them operating on the basis of a consumer price index that um, you know jumped up to 9%, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, and they're making a determination on rates, you know, two weeks, three weeks later, based on that number, they're, they're operating on yesterday's news to determine uh, policy for tomorrow's economy. That's not the best way to go. You really, as an economist, should be looking forward. And I'm just not convinced that they do enough of that. And just for a point of my own education, so I guess I always presumed that when the Fed released, you know, d different uh, metrics, that they would have plenty of daily or even weekly, you know, interim internal updates leading into the actual release. Do they not have the toolkit to be able to kind of be more sensitive? Because as you rightly point out, and I think it's important to note, you know, two things. A lot of the indicators that they look at inherently are lagging, but the other component is if they're looking at lagging, lagging indicators so intermittently, it seems like they lose a ton of sensitivity when really, obviously we all think they should gain more sensitivity to be more reactive in the current environment. Do they not just have that toolkit or like what, what's the disconnect there leading to them not getting data quickly enough? Yeah, well, they have, you know, they have hundreds of economists feeding them data and those economists certainly are trained to look at leading indicators and understand, you know, how to forecast, et cetera. But I will say that what I see in this current Fed makeup, and, and again, it's not that unique. We've seen it in past Fed regimes. Um, they're, they're really focused on headline news. I mean, you know, when CPI gets so much attention on CNBC and Bloomberg, the Fed can't help but say, hey, we got to pay attention to this too. So it's, it's not that they're yeah. not able to, you know that they're not being economists or not getting good economic data i just think their their bias is towards what's in the headlines and what's you know kind of currently in in uh you know at the forefront of the media and they're responding to that and i just some of that comes from maybe not being as market savvy a, a group uh, that's been a criticism for years that the the fed is more academic oriented you know you got academics running it so they're not as tuned into maybe market factors that can be leading indicators you know personally i would like them to focus more on some of the things that are are uh, early indicators that maybe it's time to think have we finished you know should we should we start looking the other way when lumber comes down from you know 17 and lumber future down from 1700 to 500 and below 500 actually that's that's a sign that you know you've had a big impact on on housing. You've had a big impact on construction. When you know when used car sales prices are falling pretty dramatically, it's a sign that maybe inventories you know we're finally getting a handle on new car inventories are getting back in line. So that maybe um, you know that's not in, in you know maybe we need to realize that prices are going to come down as as that you know as that supply chain situation clears up um when you see a big jump in inventories at target and walmart and other retailers to the levels that we've seen that are way beyond anything that's precedent it, it, you you need to set up and take notice of that and say gee because what a recession really is, is an inventory correction. We've got some very big inventories building around the country. And um, so, you know, it's just those kind of things that I think, it's not that they're not seeing them. I just think they're being kind of distracted by the headline inflation numbers. And as I say, you know, there's leads and lags to policy. So you need to be looking, I mean, Greenspan was probably the one Fed chairman that I saw got this to to a degree and he was notorious early on in his career when he was a private economist 
as not being a very good market person and, and stuff, but he learned. And during his reign as, as Fed chairman, he was zigging and zagging uh, earlier than was typical for, for a Fed um, because he understood that if I wait for the, you know, the proof, it's too late. So, and that's kind of what gave us the first elongated cycle we had under his regime. And this one's very long, but it's for different reasons. And interestingly, you already read my my mind on the next follow-up question, which is with seeing a lot of commodities coming down as aggressively as they are, <clears throat> sometimes we could view that as a leading indicator of where inflation might be going. But with things crashing as hard as they are, I would be interested in your perspective on what is the propensity for a recession as you see it today, right now? Yeah, I, I believe we're in recession right now. Okay. Uh, we, but, you know, we're probably going to get a negative GDP print for the second quarter. So, you know, by definition, first quarter was negative. Second, if that doesn't get revised, you can have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. That's a recession. But even more than that, it's these other things we're seeing in the economy that suggest if we're not in recession, we're pretty darn close. And my concern is again, that um, it, what's lining up is that from here, the drop gets a lot more aggressive. So, you know, housing is rolling over. I think it rolls over hard in the coming months. Um, autos could roll over hard. Um, you know, you're seeing retail having to correct that, you know, historic inventory number that's going to cause problems. The consumer is tapped out. I mean, he's, you know, with gasoline at $5 now, yes, it's come down, but still high. You know, he just doesn't have discretionary spending. And what I think we are seeing this summer is, you know, the pandemic's also made things harder to forecast probably, or made it different. Um, what we're seeing this summer, I think, is uh, consumers are switching. They're, they don't have money for both. So they're switching from you know, the material buying that they did during the pandemic, you know, a lot, of, a lot of money spent on their houses and their yards and um, things like that, um, you know, exercise equipment, et cetera, computers. Now they're, they're switching to experiences. You know, we're going to go on vacation. We haven't done a long vacation in a long time. We're, you know, we're going to take a, a, an error, you know, uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna take an airline and go somewhere. Um, we're seeing a lot more of that. We're gonna do a cruise. So they're not now they're kind of backing off from the expenses on the home uh, and other you know material purchases, um, durable purchases, and they're going to you know maybe a little more vacation type stuff, uh, dining out, what have you. My concern is that's kind of probably more seasonal than anything it's it's right. because of summer and they're saying hey we didn't get to take a vacation the last two years because of the pandemic and they're doing it but they may be kind of extending themselves to do it when summer gets done that's gone but the, it doesn't mean you flip flop back to the you know the the material purchases so you're still going to be i think in a situation where both are gone and there goes the economy you know, service, in other words, services and, um, you know, consumer spending are gone. One of the interesting articles I read not too long ago, it was from one of the banks. I don't remember if it was uh, Goldman. I think it was Goldman, but they were talking about, this was only a few months ago, and they were talking about how consumers had unhistorically high savings because of what they were seeing, you know, the stimulus from COVID, they weren't spending a ton on like you were just highlighting a lot of vacations going out, things like that. And it seems like the burn rate for that is much faster than, than they anticipated, or it seems like they might've been messaging that to try to get people to calm down a little bit. But when does the pin drop in your mind when saying, yeah, consumers are tapped out. They've essentially spent what they could. They don't have money to spend more. When, when does that occur? Like, yeah, what, when does that occur in your mind? 
Yeah, I think it, it's about to occur or is occurring. So we're there. Um, frankly, you know, we had a 35% savings rate back in the pandemic because of all the handouts. You know, you had right. trillions of money going out to people in terms of the, the stimulus checks. Um, and we had, I mean, it was unprecedented. We never saw money like we've seen come out of the government. It got, it got banked, it got put in savings. That has gone from a 35% rate down to 4.4% rate, which is actually below the pre-pandemic levels. Um, that's to have that happen in a matter of months, you know, I think a year is just unbelievable. And it's it's a sign of two things. One, um, that the consumer is having trouble keeping up with the cost of living, but secondly. And this is the thing that's hard to get a handle on is there's a lot of people who took that money and said, hey, this is great. I don't have to work. You know, I'm staying home. And they, they're at that level now where they used up that savings in many cases. And yeah, there's still jobs out there right now, but that may not be the case six months from now. And, you know, you are seeing, particularly in the technology sector, lots of big layoffs in companies that never had layoffs. You know, the, the Teslas of the world, the Apples of the world, the um, Googles of the world, you know, the Facebooks of the world, they're, they're starting to have to look at costs and cut costs. And um, that, I think that's gonna be for them, for the younger generation, you know, a place where it was always a, a source of jobs may not be anymore. And, and they, you know, kind of anecdotally, you know, you, you, anywhere you go, restaurants are saying we can't get help. Um, you know, uh, dry cleaners are saying we can't get help. You know, uh, the targets of the world, you know, their, their stores are messier because they don't have the same uh, ability to get, um, you know, part-time employees to do the work or what have you. So I, I think we have, somehow the pandemic has changed particularly that entry level um, person, you know, or, or that crowd of people who particularly, let's say part-time high school help, you know, uh, summer help during your college years, et cetera. We're just not seeing the same flow of people into those jobs. And I, I don't hear anybody talking about that, but I think that is part of the story too. Yeah, that's it's an interesting perspective because as you were just sharing some of the places that are short of help, uh, even here, you know, you're on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast, and it's the same exact thing here in San Diego. We're we're seeing the same exact instances where places are having a hard time finding people. And also to your point, you know, on revising guidance, I don't know if you saw that Apple, you know, they just essentially advised revised guidance a couple of days ago. They're coming up on earnings soon. Um, I think this week or next week. And they were saying, you know, hey, we're we're kind of slowing spending, we're slowing developmental spending over the next year, we're kind of buckling up here. And I think that shook a lot of people up because of exactly what you're talking about. You know, everybody looks at Apple. I mean, Apple literally is a cash cow. I'm pretty sure they have like a, a swimming pool of gold coins that Scrooge McDuck could swim in. Um, but even they're talking about, they want to slow it down. So I think everybody's looking at that as kind of a precursor that, you know, the even the big names with a ton and ton of support and resources are starting to slow it down. So I think that, yeah, go. Yeah, I was going to say, because I am so, you know, we're talking so much about the near term, but as you know, I have a, a forecast for the next year of a global bust. Mm -hmm. So getting from here to there may not be a, you know, a complete straight line. We may have a bounce in one of these quarters. Um, but I think what is being overlooked is, because I keep hearing uh, uh, among a lot of pundits and uh, elsewhere, um, a lot of people talking soft landing and saying, well, the market's, you know, pretty much discounting a, a shallow recession. We're not, we're not looking for anything you know, deep. And I feel like everything is lining up for a very deep recession. In fact, what I call the biggest downturn in the past 80 years. And, uh, but it doesn't get there immediately. You know, it, it kind of gradually gets there. You, it's, it's like 
things happen slowly and then all of a sudden they happen fast. <laughs> and and I, I think at least from what my work shows right now, we're probably not gonna see that bust much before the end of the year uh, and it'll dominate 2023, but it's all one thing. People on Twitter will ask me, you know, what happens between your recession and your bust? And I go, it's all one thing. It's all part of the same, um, you know, Fed tightening cycle. It's all part of the same thing. It just, you know, it doesn't necessarily all happen in a very linear way, number one. Right. And number two, even if it is fairly linear, it takes time to get to that second stage where it's, it's number one, it's global, and number two, it's very deep. And there's kind of two different avenues I want to discuss off of that. I'll, I'll pivot more to just your overall assessment first, because again, everybody would string me up if I uh, didn't dive a little further into what you're expecting. And it's for good reason. You, you have a very informed opinion. So I know the last time we spoke, we were talking about a melt up leading into a global bust. And I know on Twitter, people are always at your throat, you know, asking, is this the melt up? Is this the melt up? Is that the melt up? And one of the things I am wanting to understand from your perspective is it, a lot of times we do see that, right? Where there is a pretty profound movement in the broad scale markets before there's a even broader decline that that's fairly common throughout the history. But how much does the Fed interjection factor into your decision if it does at all? I'm curious if what they're doing and what kind of impact that has on your assessment of things. Yeah, first, I, I am still calling for that melt up. And I think I think the lows are in for this. There, you know, there's no guarantees. I mean, it's sure. it's quite possible that you could um, you know, undercut the 3650 on the S P and go down to 3500. I, I can't rule that out. That could happen. But I think the more likely scenario is that we saw the lows in June down at 3650. We've been basically spending the last month kind of slowly working our way up from 36.50, you know, got up to 39, uh, almost 4,000 today and backed off. Um, I don't know where it is now, but, um, and so, you know, I, I think we can, you know, there's a pretty good chance that we saw the lows. Um, you know, if I were picking a scenario, and again, it could go any number of different ways, but right now there's a setup where we could go to 41, 4,200 and then back off back to right. you know, 38 or 900, but still stay above the lows um, so that you can say the bottom's in or the, you know, the, the worst of the correction is behind us. But that doesn't mean you're off to the races in the next two weeks. Um, right. you, know, you got the Fed meeting next week, et cetera. So, so that's what's confusing when people say is a melt up beginning well um people might if i said yes people might take that to mean okay we're straight up from here no right. it, it's probably still in a period where it's going to be back and forth trying to sort this out but i think the lows may may well be in um and i do believe over the course of the next several months we're going to head towards six thousand on the s p twenty thousand on the nasdaq um, you know, 45,000 on Dow. Those are huge historic moves. Uh, if they happen as fast as they could, meaning by the end of the year or, you know, it could spill over into next year. That's a, a very steep move that's almost unprecedented. It's certainly only press, precedent a couple times in, in history. Um, but I think that's what we're probably going to have. And people go, based on what I just talked with you about, Eric, in terms of the economy, for a lot of people, that seems like it doesn't jive. You know, how, how can yeah, you be like talking about when I'm talking about such awful economy in the next year? Um, and what I think can happen is the Fed can pivot or the Fed can see some of what I'm talking about coming in terms of the economy and say, hey, maybe we did go too far. And they can, they can either just pause or they could even pivot. And the market is so bearish right now and so right. positioned for the downside that they may have to, first of all, cover shorts and secondly, come running back in because they're out of sync with what's going on. 
I think we can have a very concentrated move. Um, and people say, well, how, if people see the bad news in the economy, how can they justify buying? What will happen is they'll view this as the tightening cycle is over. The Fed's beginning to have our back is, you know, the wind's at our back again instead of in our face. We can look over the trough and start seeing better times six months or nine months from now. Markets discount six and nine months in advance. Um, does that mean six or nine months from now things are going to be good? I don't think so. I'm, I think they're going to be bad. But that's my expectation. That's my forecast. The street could easily say, okay, the Fed did its job. We're having a soft landing and we can look over the soft landing to better times. And that better times, if if they've if inflation starts coming down, as I think it will, if the oil prices keep coming down, as I think they may, as some of these things show up in the inflation numbers, people can start saying, hey, the Fed did its job. Now we have room for, you know, the next, um, part of the cycle, you know, or it extends the cycle for a couple few years. Again, I'm not forecasting that, but that's what street expectation could become that could justify a big run in the market. And what I think is pretty clear is that everybody right now, I should say everybody, certainly a large majority of people expect lower lows, expect, you know, a longer tightening cycle. If that changes if people's expectations change you will be very um i think people will be very surprised at how fast we go from this negative environment we've had all through this year into a very positive environment mark market wise right yeah that, that it's a fascinating perspective and i could see the the catalyst in that scenario you especially because you're right i i do think um the the broad sentiment is everybody's buckling up for a bumpy ride so if it seemed like the fed was starting to change or even soften their tone i think the market and they have a couple times the markets react already you know in in some small ways regarding potential rate raises so that leads me to the next question then which is if that doesn't happen. So let's say we get to the next FOMC meeting and the Fed says, nope, inflation is still too high. Do you still think that there's a scenario for the melt up to occur before the bust? And if so, what does that scenario look like? Yeah, I, I will tell you, and I've said this many times on, on Twitter, I always say that the bond market leads and the Fed follows. So I'm I'm not in the business of trying to predict what Jay Powell is going to do or what FOMC sure. is going to do on any, you know, at any given time, I can give you a general idea of what I think they might do over time, but how do I know what they're going to do? You know, I don't, frankly, you know, my guess is we'll see 75 base points, which is pretty much consensus right now in, in next week's meeting, but I can't say it couldn't be a hundred, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're humans. They can make their mind up next week. Um, so I don't I don't play the game of trying to predict exactly what they're going to do in a, in a particular meeting. And I also don't play the game of saying, OK, I know July is the last one and they're not going to hike in September. I have no idea. But what I can do with some predictability is look at the bond market. And I think the bond market is signaling lower rates. So I, you know, whether the Fed is in sync with what the bonds are going to be doing over the next three months. I can't tell you, but I'm pretty sure, you know, at least my confidence is that that in the, over the next three months, interest rates are coming down treasury bond wise. You know, I think the 10 year is heading for two and a half and maybe 2% by the end of the year. I think the 30 year is heading, you know, down from 3% down. Now, right now we're getting a little back up in rates the last two days. You know, we could go to 320 on the 10 year before we go down. That's, you know, it's currently, you know, 3% or thereabouts. Because the Fed is is behind the curve, they can hike. Uh, and my, my, my forecast is not dependent on whether they stop after July or whether there's another hike in September. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't matter as long as bonds are doing what I expect. And I'm pretty confident that we're going to see lower rates lower inflation and the fed will 
you know, maybe pause after July or maybe pause after September. I think it's one or the other. Um, and uh, I don't think my scenario, you know, melt up scenario depends on which it is. Got so, it. Um, like I said, I just, I can give you my best guess that they pause after July, but I'm not too, you know, I'm not too uh, confident that I can predict what Powell's going to do in the next two months, you know, three months. Um, yeah. So, so basically my forecast is a melt up first and hasn't changed melt up first to the same targets I've had all year. And then uh, a global bust and an 80% bear market. So I, I think that we're nowhere near the end of trouble. I just think there's a respite here that's going to be surprisingly strong in, in terms of how it's reflected in the market. Yeah, that, that's really helpful context to understand the catalyst specifically for the melt up, mostly coming from bonds and whether or not the Fed has, you know, a, a, a contributing factor or not. That's less so the, the focus for you, which is um, it's interesting to watch that. So I'm actually um, really curious to see how, how that will work out. And then we have, you know, a little less than five minutes left. So. I would love to understand what precedes the bust. How do you see the economy looking when we start hitting your targets from the melt up? And what is the economic functions that start leading to the actual bust? I'm assuming it has to come from a global scale. So there's probably external uh, factors as well. But yeah, love your thoughts. Yeah, so it's... It there's a lot of different aspects of this um, because it is a global bust. Um, I think some of the trouble is going to be the triggers are going to come from overseas. Whereas, you know, in 2008, nine, it was our subprime problem was the primary trigger. Um, this time around, I think Europe's in more trouble than we are. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, everything going on in Ukraine and going on with natural gas, those are all things that are putting, you know, if, if we're in trouble, Europe's really in trouble, right? I mean, they, right. they don't know whether they're going to have energy to to heat uh, homes next winter to the degree they need. So, um, I, and inflation's really breaking out there as it is here, and they still are in on the short end, still in negative rate territory, and so um, they have to hike. You know, tomorrow the ECB de decides what they're going to do. There's you know talk of a fifty basis point hike. Um, we don't know what they're going to do. You know, it's going to be a hike, I think, pretty definitely, whether it's quarter or 50, I don't know. Um, but though, those are the kind of things that I think could be part of where the bus comes from as well, is they have to, they may be hiking into a very weak environment, even more so than we are. And there may, they may not have as much um, staying power as we did during this period of higher rates, you know, that we had some resilience built in that that they don't have. So, you know, all of that, you've got a, a more leveraged financial system over in Europe this time around. You've got, um, you know, weaker, uh, you know, I think hollower economies for a number of reasons. Uh, the ECB, you know, you've got different countries in different places. So their policy can really hit some of the countries hard and harder than others. And, and your strong points, you know, particularly Germany is, is facing some pretty dire situations. So, so there's lots of reasons to point to Europe as a problem. I think Australia and Canada, if, if um, you know, commodities start coming down here, that's gonna impact them. Canada's housing is where we were in 2008, nine. They're much more leveraged yep. than than we are today. Um, Australia's uh, real estate is, is straight up for you know a long time, so they're very vulnerable. There's and and then you know we have we have Asia that's having to deal with a very strong dollar. That's you know that's an unknown in terms of when are we going to have some accidents come about because uh, you know a lot of these these uh, particularly emerging countries funded debt in dollar terms, you know, right. and dollar denominated debt. And now you've got a dollar through the roof and they have to they have to use those dollars to pay to service their debt. And some of them aren't gonna be able to make it. So there's 
those things are all working. They're all there. They can come at any time. I'm, I'm betting that we're going to see the Fed recognize some of those problems and put some pressure on the, you know, uh, and it's one of the reasons why I expect maybe July is the last hike for a little while. And that, uh, you know, it will impact the dollar on the, in terms of pushing it back down some. So there's, there's lots of, you know, moving parts here, but I think generally what that's all pointing to is, um, you know, maybe we've done all we can do on the downside here in the short run. And that way, maybe we have a respite of three to six months where, um, you know, markets can, can see the glasses half full. Man, it is no shortage of drama out there. It's, it really is interesting just understanding the, the broader scale, because a lot of times I feel like from the U.S. side, we think about the U.S., but we do forget, especially as retail traders, in my opinion, um, you know, for my community, that there is a lot of interconnectedness and a lot of that has profound impacts uh, of of scale. So I appreciate you walking us through just a little bit of the broader landscape. We are up at time here. So I want to make sure we get you um, out the door on time. For uh, anybody that wants to find you, I know that you're on Twitter at Dave H. Contrarian. I'll throw that link in the video description below for anybody who wants to find you there. And then there are plenty of people that impersonate you. So I will be uh, very explicit about the right accounts to follow so that folks can find you. Um, but thanks a ton you know, for hanging out for a little bit, sharing your thoughts, sharing the information you've amassed over a really long career in the markets. It's extremely beneficial to us. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, enjoyed it. And the last thing I'll say is uh, yeah. we didn't talk about it in, in specific terms, but really psychology is a big part of markets. And that's what people have to understand is don't, don't just focus on, you know, what's the economy doing? What's the Fed doing? Also understand what's already discounted and, and you know, what, where is psychology at? And right now, psychology is very bearish. And that usually indicates that you're pretty close to a turn in the other direction. We will soon find out. Thank you so much for your time, David. Really appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Eric. Take care.